Good evening and welcome to everyone. Today is July 12th, 2022. Welcome and thanks to everyone for joining us today. As you know, I'm Phil Santonzi, Program Chair for ASQ Section 1510 Southeast Florida. Um, if you'd like to know more about ASQ, Southeast Florida Section, you can check our site on the Communities tab of the myasq.org website. Um, and you can also join our LinkedIn group, ASQ Southeast Florida Section 1510. So at this point, I would just like to introduce Steve Kramer, who's our section chair. And uh, Steve, do you have a few words for the, for the members? Oh, well, again, welcome. It's great yeah. to see everyone. And uh, like everyone else here, I am anxious for us to get back together person to person um, at our different areas. Um, and just to let you know, we're in negotiations right now, even with our sister uh, professional organization, the uh, IISE, uh, Industrial Engineering, Industrial and System Engineering Organization Miami, wants to have a training workshop in uh, the end of August, I believe. So we may be co-doing that. And you'll know all about that because Kara, our wonderful webmaster, will be posting all this type of information as soon as it as it firms up on our LinkedIn webpage. So please keep advised, keep your eyes on that prize. Uh, but it's just to let you know, as we go through the summer, sometimes, you know, historically, we haven't had any programming during the summer. And then we said, well, let's start doing live streaming, even though we're having in ground and then pandemic. And now we're like, well, why don't we just keep doing at least virtual during the summer because it serves our members. So I applaud, uh, especially Phil Santonzi, who not only steps up personally, but is our program chair and supports all of us as members at ASQ providing member value. And so our hats continually off to Phil to Santonzi and his uh, unequaled support for our section forever and ever and always. So thanks always, Phil. Um, it's well, great to see Steve. everyone. Please, uh, please follow up. We do have, and uh, Carol will be sending out soon, the July newsletter, which reiterates we have an open board position. So you can write home to mom and tell her all your accomplishments and say, now you're on the board of something. So you know, get off your case. So that would be nice. So please, please get engaged because it's all about you, the, uh, the members of volunteers making us good or bad or whatever. So we always need your help and we're always interested in your input. So I uh, enjoy tonight and get engaged and uh, go ASQ. Thanks, Steve. But we will be looking to partner with the IISE in South Florida to in future future events at, with the education events like Steve just talked about, and perhaps joint meetings as well, and and uh, and speakers and so on. Okay, so like I said, I will make it, be making the presentation tonight. Industry 4.0 and technology readiness. Um, as far as you know, I, I, I'll introduce myself briefly. Um, you know, I've been I've been involved with. Uh, assessment in, in organizations across all sectors in manufacturing um, and, uh, you know, other, other sectors of, of uh, for-profit business and not-for-profits in education and healthcare and so on. Um, I've, I've worked in, I'm, I'm working with Florida Makes currently, which is a not-for-profit organization that's focused mostly on manufacturing, but I've, um, I also have my own, um, uh, you know, uh, consulting company, consulting organization, Pause Impact, which I have been, uh, I, I've actually started about 16 years ago and working with, with companies across, across the board, as I said. Um, I have been involved with the Florida Sterling Council uh, since 1994, a long time. I, I was a master examiner for 17 years. I'm currently the, uh, the lead uh, judge for the Governor Sterling Award. In, in Florida and the uh, the highest award uh, that's offered in Georgia as, as well, the Georgia Oglethorpe Award, which is which is sort of the, the Sterling sister in that state. Uh, both are based on uh, the uh, the Baldridge at the at the federal level. Um, I also, with the Sterling and Florida Makes, I'm the lead examiner and judge of the Sterling Manufacturing Business Excellence Award uh, evaluation process, which which is conducted annually. Uh, we've just finished uh, the last year, and we'll be starting the next cycle coming up in the in the fall. Um, but uh, but with all that, you know, I've I've done a, a ton of, of assessments on organizations, and recently working with uh, with Baldridge actually, and uh, uh, we have a a um, Florida makes has a, a grant from the federal government from the Department of Commerce to look at how to incorporate industry 4.0, and we'll talk about that, 
Industry 4.0 in with the Baldridge evaluation, you know, the performance excellence framework. So we'll, uh, that's part, that's, that's really what I'll be talking about tonight is, is all of that and what that, what that really, um, you know, what that, what that means uh, for, for technology readiness and so on. Moving right now, so Industry 4.0 and technology readiness. And, and the assessment really is to determine whether an organization is, is you know, ready to effectively implement new technologies. Um, it's not just a matter of, of bringing a technology in. And, and as I was talking even before this meeting in the networking, you know, it doesn't, you just don't plop it, plop the technology in and hope it fixes, it fixes your problems because that just doesn't, doesn't happen. So what is Industry 4.0? Well, You'll hear that Industry 4.0, uh, you know, it's called several different things. You know, you hear it called Smart Factory. You might hear Manufacturing 4.0 or even Quality 4.0, Advanced Manufacturing Technologies. I sort of lean towards Advanced Manufacturing Technology. It's a little more generic, and, and that's, that's typically what I, what I end up uh, talking about most of the time. Um, you also hear it called the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Since the time of the earliest tools and the mastery of fire, technological progress has been an integral part of being human. By utilizing technology, we have surpassed the most efficient and capable life forms on our planet. But in a world of ever increasing complexity and finite resources, we are now presented with a whole new set of challenges. How will the next industrial revolution change the way we live and quite possibly what it means to be human? Throughout history, there have been periods of remarkable innovation. The first industrial revolution created new goods and new jobs through the introduction of manufacturing. The power of water, iron, and steam helped bring manufacturing out of our homes and into a larger world. Cities and opportunities grew. In the second, we forged better materials such as steel, harnessed the power of oil through internal combustion engines, and utilized electricity through generators and transmission lines. We catalyzed manufacturing and expanded what was possible. After the digital revolution, we possess computers so small they can fit in our pockets, and they're a million times cheaper and a million times more powerful than the best supercomputer only 25 years ago. Connecting through the internet has encouraged an incredible library of knowledge, setting the stage for the greatest revolution yet. So what is the fourth industrial revolution? Industry 4.0 involves a range of new technologies that are fusing the physical, digital, and biological worlds and impacting all disciplines, economies, and industries. Central to this revolution are emerging technology breakthroughs in areas such as robotics, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, autonomous vehicles, nanotechnology, and 3D printing. These technologies can improve lives, create new jobs, make goods cheaper and better, and impact the world in ways we have yet to imagine. While it's remarkable to see the current trends, it's important to remember that technological progress is not simply guaranteed. It requires people to make it happen. This is your opportunity to get involved. This revolution does not happen without your help. Now is the time to be imagining. Now is the time to be creating. Now is the time to be a manufacturer. The message is, is what you heard. You know, there's, you know, obviously Industry 4.0, they call it that, the fourth industrial revolution, because there were, there were three others before. Most of the companies that I've, I've visited, many of the smaller companies I visit and assess are still at Industry 3.0 stage. You know, they really haven't, and they're not even sure that they can move to 4.0. They think that the 4.0 is for, for big companies, you know, the, the, uh, the new technologies and all that. Um, but, you know, manufacturing is undergoing that major transformation, as you heard, there's a lot of disruption, there's new materials, and, and you know, businesses are evolving. Um, you know, customers evolve, of course, and, and all the changes in business will impact customers. That's the primary reason for the businesses being there in the first place. Uh, so when we, when we talk about Industry 4.0, um, these are the core technologies that uh, we usually refer to. That, that disk in the center is the, are the foundational technologies. You know, you've got cybersecurity and systems integration, and, and then you've got the, the continuous uh, improvement uh, uh, element of, of that as well, lean continuous improvement. And, you know, that's the, the process basis. But, but really all of the, those, those um, 
seven on the, the seven technologies around the, around the disk uh, are really dependent on cybersecurity and systems integration. You know, those are, like I say, those are foundational um, technologies that, that really support all the others, all the rest. You got additive, you know, 3D manufacturing, the augmented reality, automation, big data, cloud computing, Internet of Things with the connection between many, between uh, pieces of equipment, for instance, simulation. You know, all of those things really contribute um, and, and are supported by you know, the systems integration, your know, vertical integration and horizontal integration from customer to supplier and back. Um, so that, that's what we look at. When we uh, that's what we think about when we're looking at uh, at. The, uh, the core technologies of Industry 4.0. Um, some of the considerations and challenges that that we you know are up against um, you know when, when with Industry 4.0 is uh, you know the dollars that even despite all the dollars that are are spent there's still you know a gap between the the uh, technology that's available and our ability to put it to work effectively and you know and to implement it effectively so that it it really does you know, fill, fulfill the, the goals uh, and the objectives that we have for technologies. One of the, the key points I, I hope that you'll take away from tonight is the, the key point about, uh, you know, thinking strategically about technology. I have seen companies that, that you know, bring in a piece of technology and, you know, hope it fits in someplace or hope it'll do the job that they want it to. You know, I was a, at a client last week, I did an assessment. They had a cobot um that was sitting on in, literally in the corner of the of the production floor with the tarp over it uh they bought it you know many months ago and they still haven't really put it in place i guess they thought it was neat to have and they they tried you know they, they they're going to use it somewhere but they don't know where yet because they don't have a plan and that's that's important is to have that plan not just a technology plan but a, a company strategic plan in order in order to be able to move forward and understand what you know what the what it is that you, you need in order to accomplish long-term goals. Uh, new technology for technology's sake, uh, that's, that's similar to the strategic, you know, does it answer a need? Does it really fill a need that you have within your processes? Um, the, the workforce, you know, is everybody on board? Is everybody engaged, involved? Is there training? Do they have the right skills for technology? These are some of the considerations that we have, we must have when we, we uh, talk about uh, bringing technology into our companies. Uh, technology doesn't change a process, okay? It's got to integrate into the existing process. And again, we talked about this in the networking a little bit earlier too. Communication, you know, you've got to communicate the benefits of new technology to all stakeholders, not just, not just the workforce, but to your customers and your suppliers as well. And, and, and some of the best technologies will also include a closer integration with both ends of that, uh, of that uh, supply chain. Um, and then the support system, you know, it's got to be responsive to the stakeholder needs and, and provide the right resources for the technology that we use. Each of the programs, the Baldridge is the, is the federal program. It comes out of the U.S. Department of Commerce and from NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technologies within the Department of Commerce. That's a public-private partnership you can see, you can see, and it's intended to improve national competitiveness. The, uh, the Sterling Council, in fact, they just changed. The name was Florida Sterling Council, uh, but because they've adopted the, the Georgia program, it's now the Sterling Council. So it's a regional uh, approach. It's a, there's a Florida approach and, and a Georgia approach within the Sterling Council. Uh, but it is not-for-profit public-private uh, corporation, and it's intended to help achieve you know, high-performing uh, results from organizations um, in Florida and in Georgia, both, but two separate programs within each of those each of those states. Um, again, I've been with the I was I started as a volunteer with the Sterling Council back in 1994, and I'm still a volunteer um, with uh, with them. Uh, although my company, Florida Makes, is a partner with the Sterling Council, and uh, and we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Florida Makes and Sterling both uh, sponsor the the Sterling uh, Manufacturing Business Excellence Award. So this is the, the framework of the, the Sterling management system. It's the same framework, although it's different, different uh, graphic uh, for, for Baldrige. Um, you've got, uh, you know, I'll get into more detail on all these things, but, but these the dark blue boxes that you see here are the criteria categories. There are seven of those. You can see leadership strategy, customers here on the left, workforce operations and results over on the right. 
and in uh, measurement analysis and knowledge management uh, as part of the foundation foundational uh, uh, set of criteria for for this. At the top uh, is the organizational profile, and I'll get to, into a little more detail on each of these things. The organizational profile, which essentially sets the context of the organization, you know, what's important to the company, uh, what does it what does it look like, literally, uh, you know, in uh, uh, and and the way it looks is really or I should say the way the criteria are applied really depends on the organizational profile. Uh, but uh, probably the most important aspect of this are the core values and concepts, which is that foundational a foundational uh, aspect of the entire uh, model. Uh, this model, by the way, if you, you see there on the bottom of the page, uh, is a reference in the systems resource guide. Um, and it tells you with the page that's on. But uh, you all should have, um, when you receive your registration confirmation for this meeting tonight, there, there was a link um, to, to that file, to the, to the research guide, it's like a 70 page. So if you, if you still have your email and you didn't pick it up, go, but you can go back and pick that up at any point, uh, or you can let me know and I can send you another, or I can even put it in the, in the chat at the end of this if you want to put the link there. Uh, but, uh, but core values, and concepts are are really you know the behaviors and the characteristics of high performing organizations. When the Baldrick was first created back in the in the late eighties, late nineteen eighties, um, it, it was built on uh, you know it wasn't built behind the desk. You know it wasn't just a, a really smart person behind the desk putting all this stuff together. It was really what, what they did was uh, looked at what were considered high performing organizations back then. And, and they went to see what are the core values? What are the, the, those key behaviors, those key characteristics that those companies had in common? And they came up with a bunch. Uh, I think it was like 13 or 14 uh, at the time. These 11 are the most recent uh, evolution of, of, of those same criteria. And you can see that, you know, the, 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 uh, what they are there. You can read those for yourself. But the criteria are actually built on those values. You know, the criteria are really designed to uh, to embed these core uh, these core values and core concepts into into an organization. Um, if you look at this diagram on the on the next page here, it's a little bit blurry, but but the, you don't have to read it in, in, uh, specifically. You just just kind of get a, a good big picture look at this thing. It, this blue central, you know, uh, circle and the and the white, the systems perspective. You might be able to read that. Uh, that those are the uh, the criteria. I'm sorry, those are the the core values and the concepts. And the the next ring, this uh, the gray ring around the blue, are the the criteria. And those are those are as I said, those are really um, uh, you know the the values are embedded in the criteria. You know, in in the systematic processes. That's another sort of a of a key, uh, if you look at, at the, um, um, you know, if you if you go through and really understand the criteria and what it, it's really looking at process and, and looking at system, you know, how things are done in an organization. And, and so these, these values are embedded into the criteria through the, you know, through the criteria. And the criteria are comprised of questions. They're all questions. Um, and the lighter blue, the lighter blue, uh, ring around the outside are the, the the performance results. You can see, you know, there's there's the uh, uh, product and process results. There's the customer related results. There's the the workforce results. Uh, there's leadership and government results, and there's the financial, market, and strategic re strategy results. So you know that's that's the entire kind of the, the whole model. Uh, you know of uh, um, you know. Core values leading to the to the criteria, uh, which in turn can lead to the effectiveness of the organization, and uh, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about all of those here in a second. So the organizational profile, as I said before, it's really a, a uh, so it's really a, a starting point for any assessment, you know, any organizational assessment. Um, in fact, the organizational profile alone for some companies that are um, I would say average or maybe even, you know, less developed type of companies, the organizational profile itself can be used as an assessment because the, the organizational profile asks questions that, that every company, every organization should have answers to. And I've worked with a lot of them. I've, I've gone through organizational profiles with the companies 
and and they don't really they don't really have answers to all those questions. I mean, you think you would think you should know you know who your customers are, right? You think you know with the customer groups that you have. You would think that you know what regulatory um, uh, you know environment you're you're operating in, and and so on and so forth. On on one side here, you know, we're talking about the organizational description. There's an organizational environment that looks at the product and service offerings, the mission, vision, values, and culture. That's that's on those less developed companies. That's an area that that I find is is lacking quite a lot. They don't really have a mission, vision, values, and culture. Or if they do, it's in the head of the of the of the boss, and it doesn't really get communicated. It's it's really difficult for the workforce to be to, to really reach its potential performance without understanding what mission, vision, and values are uh, of the company. Uh, workforce profile. You know, what does the workforce look like? Um, you know, and, and, and the way when people are answering this, companies answer this in terms of, of uh, you know, applying for an assessment award or something like that, you know, they'll get into looking at the different employee types, looking at uh, educational, uh, you know, categories, perhaps uh, diversity categories, a lot of stuff that can go in there. It's really what's important to the organization uh, as far as what, what actually the answers are written into that. It looks at the assets and, and the regulatory environment. Uh, and it looks at the relationships, organizational relationships, you know, the structure of the organization, the customers and the stakeholders, uh, the suppliers, the partners and collaborators. And then, and then the, the other half of the profile is the organizational situation relating to the competitive environment. You know, what's the competitive position? What are the competitive changes that are, that are occurring in the marketplace? Whether they're favorable or unfavorable, doesn't matter, but what are those changes? Uh, because they might be, it might matter to the company whether it's favorable or unfavorable and what they are. And what kind of competitive data is out there? How does the, how does the organization know where it stands competitively um, and, and not just financially? This is competitively you know, in, in, in performance of the company itself as well. There's the strategic context of the organization and there's the improved performance improvement and system, obviously very important. Um, again, Many companies, many organizations don't have a standardized performance improvement system. It may be ad hoc or, or something along, along those lines. Any questions about, uh, about anything so far? As I said, you know, the, the organization profile really sets the context for understanding the organization. So as an assessor, when, when, you know, if you understand the organization profile, you really understand what's important to the company. You could have two companies you know, right next door to each other. One is a five person company, one is a 500 person company, they might do exactly the same business, uh, but they're different, obviously, right? They're different because their profile is different. One's a five person, one's a 500 person, but that's going to also change other aspects of their, of their profile. Um, and then when we get to looking at the performance of that company, we're looking at, uh, you know, uh, for a five person company, a high performing process might be very, very far from high performing for the larger company. Uh, you can imagine. So, so there's the organization profile is, is distinct and it's, it's specific and unique to the to each company that uh, um, you know that responds to the questions in the profile. Uh, but, but again, this can be used as a as an assessment all by itself, a very simple assessment. But it's it's very helpful to have the answers to all of these questions, you know, to all of these things in any kind of a, any kind of an organization. So when we talk about the, uh, the criteria of performance excellence, and again, those are the blue boxes up in the model that you see in the corner. Um, the first six categories, the leadership strategy, customers, and then workforce operations, and then measurement analysis and knowledge management. Um, those are the process categories. We call that the process because it, it really looks at the approaches, the processes, the systems. And most of those questions are how questions. You know, how do you do this? How do you do that? Because how is really getting into the process. You know, what's the process? How do you do that? Uh, sometimes when, when I do an assessment and I ask a how question, you know, hey, how do you do this? How do you do that? Sometimes I get a what answer. And a what answer usually means there's an opportunity for improvement. You know, if it's, a, if it's I'm asking for the process and they get a what answer for that process, it, it, I, I'm probably not hearing about the process. I might be hearing about a standalone on a, you know, one, one off type of situation or Maybe every time it's done, it's done differently. That's not a process. That's not a system. So that's what we're looking for in process categories. And the result category, which is the seventh category, 
is, is the performance. And that is, you know, what? That is what? What are the results? How, you know, what is the effectiveness of the, of the processes, the approaches, the systems that the company has in place? Um, are they being effective in those areas that I talked about before? You know, the, the, the product, the, the customer, uh, the, the workforce, leadership, and, and, you know, finance strategy and, uh, and market. You know, what are the re results and, and uh, you know, what is the effectiveness of those, uh, of those uh, systems that are in place? One of the things as an examiner, when, when uh, or anyone, you know, doing an assessment of, uh, of an organization using this criteria, this model, when you're looking at the process categories, those first six categories, you know, leadership, strategy, customers, um, measurement, analysis, and knowledge management, and then uh, workforce and operations. When you're looking at those and you're, you're judging the value of the processes and the systems, you know, or the approach, we use this as an acronym called, uh, we call it ADLI, A-D-L-I, and you can see the A-D-L-I, what they stand for there. Uh, we use those dimensions to determine how, how mature is the is the process is it a high performing process or not and so when we, we look at we look for approach first obviously right we want to know is there is there a process so how is this how does this get done how is this you know how do you do that how do you do this now, we were looking for process it's got to be systematic repeatable and measurable um, if there's no approach if there is no process the rest of this doesn't matter uh, it's moot you know there's, there's not going to be a deployment there there's really no learning that's happening and there's no integration uh, based on that. But if there is an approach, then you look to the other three, and they're not in any particular order. Uh, you can mix and match deployment, learning, and integration. You know, you could be high in one and, and low in any one of the others or any, any mix of the three. Um, when we talk about deployment, what we're looking at is how well is that approach being used? Is it being used in all the right places? Uh, and, and uh, you know, is it a systematic, measurable, repeatable, measurable approach that being used in all the right places and is being used consistently. As an example, um, you know, a company will probably or may have some some process for customer customer feedback, customer survey, or something like that. So a full deployment of that would be that it's fully deployed to all the customers or you know all the customer segments or something like that. Obviously, I mean, it would be ridiculous to think that the customer survey process would be deployed to the workforce. It may be a similar process, but it's not the customer survey process. Um, and so that's what deployment is. It looks at how well deployed is the process that's being, that's being, that's in place. And, uh, you know, is it, uh, is it in all the appropriate places where it should be? Alpha learning um, is, as you can read, you know, acquisition of knowledge, right? And, and there's really th three different kinds of learning that, that we think about typically. It's that, you know, individual uh, training and individual development type of knowledge, type of learning that occurs. There's process improvement or process refinement, as it says here. Um, you know, is the when I operate my process, am I collecting the data, or if I'm collecting data, am I using that data to learn how to make the process better? That's what we're talking about. That's a second kind of learning. That's a process refinement type of learning. Uh, that goes back into, into making the process better. If it's customer survey process, for instance, well, is the process itself working, working well? Am I, am I getting, you know, is it getting to all of my, all the customers, all the places that I needed to get to, all the different customer types, all different customer segments? A am I, when I'm, when I'm getting it, am I, am I slicing and dicing it so I can, I can really get to understand my customers, again, as an example. The third type of learning is the organizational learning, the, the, what, gets, what gets put back into the company. And using the customer survey process as an example, I might be out there uh, getting survey information about my product, let's say. And maybe I use some information to fix the process on, on how I survey, but the information I'm getting from that process is going to be very helpful to me in my, in my production, in my product you know, design and development and in, in, in how well I'm producing the product that I am, I am delivering to customers right now. So, so if I, you know, so there's three types, there's the individual, there's the, the process refinement, and then there's the organizational level learning that comes from processes uh, throughout the organization. And, uh, and when, as an examiner, what we look for in learning is, you know, are there, are there, is there evidence of, of, uh, of refinement? Is there evidence of uh, changes that have occurred in the 
you know, over time because of the learning that comes out of this process. And the last uh, element here, the last dimension is integration I. Uh, and that really looks at, if you notice in the, in the uh, previous, let's see, uh, in the diagram, up in this diagram, you'll notice integration is, is a word right in the middle that's connected to everything. Well, and that's, and that's you know, by design. And integration is, is that harmonization, harmonization of plans, processes, resources, you know, it's, it's the alignment with organizational strategies and objectives. So for instance, if, if I have a challenge, if I'm a company, a manufacturer, and I've got a challenge of, of acquiring adequate talent, well, that's going to affect a lot of different parts of my organization, isn't it? It's going to affect, um, it's going to obviously going to affect my, my hiring, my recruitment and hiring processes. It may affect my training and development approaches. It may, uh, it may impact um, uh, in operations. It's going to it may impact how the process is actually run. It may impact technology that I need, you know, to, 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 to compensate for skills that I don't have, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So the integration, is it aligned? throughout uh, my organization is this process, this approach, you know, and how does it tie into the results? You know, does, are there results that, that show, in fact, this area of my company is operating, you know, at a high performance level, um, you know, so we get all that. Okay. <clears throat> Again, the reference at the bottom, you can see the, the, the page that you can find this information in that, in the resource guide that I sent. Okay, so process scoring guidelines. This, this, is the, uh, this is how we score the first six categories. You can see the way this is designed. These are, we call these buckets or levels. Each, each, each one of these levels is a different way of, of describing the performance. And you can see at the low end here, the zero to 5% score. Um, you'll notice that each of these bullet points has a letter at the end, and, and you'll, you'll notice the coincidence that it's ADLI, right? So, so, you know, this is sort of the description of, of the approach at this level of scoring, the level of performance, you know, no, no approach. That makes sense, right? But you can look at all of these levels, all of these buckets, and you'll see the first bullet is always the approach. You know, how do you describe the approach that's appropriate to the, the scoring level that's given there? Now, when, as an examiner, you look at the company and, and you look at, at the, at, uh, you know, you look at ADLI, and then you look at the scoring buckets, um, you're never going to get a perfect match. And so, so, you know, the way that you score is based on, you know, the, the, uh, the best match that you can get, the, the best, uh, you know, the best connection between what you're reading and what you're actually seeing in, uh, in the company, in the organization. So you can see as you go down, obviously the scores go higher, all the way up to, to 100%. I don't know that you know, I could probably count on one hand over all the years in, in the with Sterling Award, how many organizations have ever gotten any kind of an approach in any part of, you know, any category, I should say. Uh, there may be approaches, individual approaches that reach high, high percentage, like like in this bottom, this, this top, this highest bucket. Uh, but uh, but it's rare that, that, you know, a company will get up into this, into this range. Um, but I have seen quite a few actually in, in the, you know, the next level of uh, the next level here, the 70 to 85%. Very, very good. Even, I mean, when you're talking about a 50 to 65%, you're talking about a very good organization, very good. Uh, it's not an average, you know, this is not an average. It might be in the middle of this, of this scoring guideline, but it's not an average, you know, average, my, in my opinion, average is probably, somewhere between the this 10 to 25 and the 30 to 45. That's kind of an average organization operating in that range, somewhere in there. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, so uh, usually the winners of a, of a Sterling Award or an Oglethorpe Award will be, you know, maybe in the high end of the 50 to 65s, uh, you know, most likely in, in, the, in the 70 to 85 or, or higher. Uh, but uh, but anyway, this is so. This is what we use, you know, to 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 judge what kind of scoring we're talking about. It's based on ADLI and, and a description here of of what A, what a, D, what L, and what I look like for that level. And we make our best judgment as examiners, you know, the best match that we can between what we see written here as a description to to what we actually see in the organization itself. When we talk about results, this, the category this is category seven. We talk about uh, LTCI, and, and the, the acronym is LETSI. 
you know, L-E-T-C-I, uh, but it doesn't really matter, uh, whatever, you, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but the, the levels are just what it sounds like. You know, what is the current performance? You know, where is it on the, on the chart? Uh, is it 90%? Is it 50%? Is it, you know, whatever, whatever is being measured, you know, wh what is the current level of, uh, of, that, uh, of that particular measure? Um, T is trends. You know, what's the trend been? What's the, the change uh, over time? Uh, you know, where, you know, or maybe there may be no change, but it might be, a, you know, 99.99999%, which is probably pretty good, uh, no matter what you're measuring. And, and so the trend might be flat, but it's at a very high level to begin with. And, and uh, you know, so that's, that's a positive, that's a favorable, favorable aspect of trend. So see is some comparisons. Now, now, not everything needs a comparison when we, when we look at evaluations. But, but the key things, and what are the, how do we find out some of the key things, the key factors of, of a company? We look at the organizational profile, some of the key things, you know, they'll tell us, they, they should tell us in the profile what's important to them, uh, you know, as far as what needs to get done. And if they're telling me that certain things are important, automatically as an examiner, I'm thinking, <clears throat> well, I, I, have, I know that I should find some results about that then, right? And if, if, if it's really a key thing, a key uh, element, then, then what I, I, I should also see that there's some comparisons. And it's not a comparison to the average. It's, it, you know, well, I, I, mean, I shouldn't say that. A comparison to the average is possible. It's, it's possible, but it may not be the best comparison to tell me that this is really high performing. But, but if it happens to be a benchmark organization, if, if for instance, a comparison is to, uh, let's say a Baldrige winner, you know, Baldrige winning organization, well, that's probably pretty good, um, you know, because a Baldridge, a Baldridge company, a Baldridge organization that's won an award is probably a pretty good organization. And, and if they're doing well in that particular aspect, then I should be able to do that well if I want to win an award as well, or if I just want to be high performing, regardless of the awards. Uh, but comparisons is, is what we're looking for. And it doesn't always mean that you've got to compare um, just to companies within your industry. You know, uh, I did, uh, I did a, uh, I had a client one time, it was Motorola, actually, the old, the old Motorola facility and plantation. Uh, it's shrunk quite a bit since then, if it's even there anymore. But uh, um, they, uh, they applied for the Sterling Award back about 20, I guess about 20 years ago or so. And um, in the first year that they applied, they didn't win. And the, the biggest issue, what we knew going in, was they didn't really have comparisons because they said, oh, nobody does what we do, so we can't compare. And what they did at that time was they built, uh, <laughs> they're old fashioned now, but they usually said the click to the Nextel telephone, the, 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 uh, the portable phones, the cellular phones, and it was a click to talk, you know, you could use it as a walkie talkie. They built those and, and within, I think it was within 24 hours, if you ordered it by a certain time of the day, they would build it for you, they would load in all your data, and ship it out to you, you know, within the 24 hour period. Uh, and they still, nobody does it. And it was true. Nobody else in the world did that at that time. And, um, and so we, we worked on, you know, looking for what could we compare to? And one of the things back then, uh, if you remember, you know, Dell used to, used to, when they were selling computers, they said that you can have your computer with all your software, you know, uploaded and you can have it within three days. And that was, that was considered a pretty good bench mark at the time. Um, and so, um, and so that was, that was one example of one of the comparisons that, that we used in, in their application in the following year. And that was enough. That was enough to bring them up in score so that they did actually win the, uh, the Sterling Award that following year. But comparisons are important. You know, how good is good? That's really what you're asking when you're asking about comparisons. How good is good? You might be at 99.1% of customer satisfaction, but if the rest of the world is at 99.5%, well, 99.1 doesn't look as good anymore. Um, but, but how do you know? That's, the, that's really what the measures and results are asking is, how do you know? And then integration in, uh, in the terms of results is very similar to the integration in terms of process. You know, how does it really uh, address, how are the results that you're providing really address the important performance requirements? And how does it really address that, that harmonization, that alignment across the organization in, uh, in what's being done? You know, I've seen, I've seen a lot of Sterling, uh, Sterling applications come through 
and and where you know they got tons of results, but yeah, they're not really that important. You know what you got to get to the real important stuff, and that's what we're looking for. We're looking for high performance in terms of importance in the way of results. Okay, so the result scoring it looks very similar to uh, to the uh, to the process scoring, um, and you can see it's. It's the same format, you know, it's a score in the left column here, and then there's four bullet points for the levels, trends, uh, comparisons, and, and results. You know, if you look at this, you'll see, for instance, uh, if, if there are no comparisons, um, you know, you're looking at right here, if you look at this in the 30 to 45% bucket, early stages of obtaining comparative information are evident. So if there are no comparisons, I mean, it's a really low scoring, you know, low scoring area. It, it'll end up, you know, in the 10 to 25% probably. Um, and then, and then, you know, when you start to look at the types of comparisons, you know, here, for instance, it says some, some performance levels have been evaluated against relative relevant comparisons and benchmarks and show areas of good relative performance. Uh, and then, you know, of course you go all the way down and, and, you know, industry and benchmark leadership is demonstrated in many areas. So you can see the progression and the maturity um, in the other, the other scoring sheet, the maturity of the process here, we're looking at the level of performance of the, of the organization. Back to the diagram here, you know, you've got the, the leadership strategy, customers on the left, and workforce operations results on the right, measurement analysis and knowledge management across the, across the foundation here. Um, leadership, when we talk about leadership, we're talking about, um, you know, focus on Steve. I see a hand. Yeah, I, just a, a quick question. Uh, does do they consider um, outside like certifications like CMM, CMMI and things like that as far as established performance levels regarding uh, strategic or operational processing? Well, it depends. Yes, uh, that that can be considered, and um, it, but it depends on you know is that standard considered a uh, you know, if I just meet the standard, let's just say, if I just meet, if I'm certified ISO, if I'm certified, you know, CMMC level three or level two or whatever it is, if I'm certified, it, you know, that's almost, that's almost the price of admission, so to speak, you know, for that company, because they would not, you know, so it's, it's more on a, it lean, it, these are my words, it leans more towards the average, you know, comparison as opposed to the, the really leadership type of comparison. Um, does that answer your question? You see what I'm saying? It's, it's, yeah, I, I think so. But depends. I thought in some regard, like uh, this is CMMI for software quality, that was yeah. really, that was different. If you got up to like a level five, then it was, it seemed to correlate well with your very high level performance and not yes. just an average. Yeah, it, it is considered, like I said, that is considered, um, again, that's in, that's in one aspect. That, that hmm. would probably impact category six, which is the operations operations category it re that doesn't really well it's probably i don't i'm not all that familiar with that exactly but but with like iso for instance most of that is in the operational peer piece uh, there is some procurement stuff there is some workforce you know training and development stuff that's involved there's some leadership overview you know management review and, and so on so there are bits and pieces there's some customer feedback you know there are different pieces of it that go across but most of that is really focused in the in the operations. And, and when I look at, uh, you know, I, I, that's, that's actually another, another um, area that companies can, can improve upon the way that they, they use those kinds of standards, you know, to, to and, and they try to translate that standard into high performance for the company overall. It may very well provide high performance and quality in the product that they're producing, but it doesn't really address a lot of other things that happen in the company. You know, I, I look at it as that those standards, and I say, you know, it's very good, obviously, the ISO 9001 or the AS 9100 or something. It's the real core, it, it's all process based, right? And which is, which is you know, uh, uh, the core of, of the Sterling model, the Baldage model, but it is the core, literally. You know, I think of it as, a, as the ball. And then, you know, so, and then a concentric ball around the outside yeah. is really the whole organization. So it's a good so, part of that. 
but it doesn't doesn't address the other aspects. Yes. So it's so it's like necessary but not sufficient. So Correct. those things can be very useful pieces, but they may not. They're certainly or generally not a panacea. You got to be careful that you may be all dressed up in one area but not around others, which are equally important. Got it. Thanks. Correct. Correct. And so yeah, so when we're looking at, at the categories of leadership here, and and to take this back to the you know to, to the premise of this whole presentation is you know are you ready to imp to effectively implement technologies? Every one of these categories that we're that we're going to look at here, all all of the categories really have an impact on on readiness for technology implementation. Um, and that's really that's really I want to get your you know a little interaction with with everybody on the call. Um, you know, we've got, uh, first we're gonna talk about leadership. You know, here, here's, you know, what we're looking at leadership is how leaders lead, you know, how they govern, how they make societal contribution. That's pretty, that's pretty generic type sounding words, but, but there, the aspects in here are many, you know, there's, there's the establishment of mission, vision uh, and values and, you know, developing the culture, setting the organization on a, on a, on a traje trajectory. Uh, it is the governance of the organization, you know, accountability, it's, it's uh, ethics, you know, how do you ensure ethics? Um, and, and then the societal contributions is not just, not just for philanthropic reasons, that may be what's important to the company, but typically when we look at societal contributions, we're looking at, at uh, uh, you know, the impact, the favorable or unfavorable impact on the community, whether it's a geographic community or a discipline, uh, you know, type of, of a community. Um, you know, are they, how do the societal uh, and the community activities align with the overall objectives of the company? You know, uh, uh, if, I, if I'm assessing a, a, a company uh, in the, let's say the marine industry, okay, a boat builder, you know, I would, some of the things that I might expect to see in societal contributions and community activity might be, um, uh, you know, some, some sort of involvement in, you know the waterway cleanup where people walk along the beaches and and, and you know pick up trash. Uh, you know that might be one area that I I could get involved with, for instance, because it ties back to my main business in some way. Uh, you know, so I'm looking for all that. So so being strictly philanthropic and generous is not is not really the end all. That's a that's a really good reason. Uh, but it, but some of it is kind of again my opinion is, is sort of like selfish you know what's what's how is that going to affect and, and impact me maybe it gets me more exposure go ahead steve yeah it's it smells kind of like and, and i well, i'll just say what it is it smells kind of like it's a green thing but not necessarily so if i take your case of a boat manufacturer if they provide uh, let's say community boating safety courses then that's a societal contribution and you could argue that's not green it's like yeah but that's not the point you're making a societal contribution making making Correct. societal impact so it's not necessarily correlated with let's say green or carbons and any of that other stuff it's 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 directly along mission in the society and the needs of the local community correct that's right Good. i've got that's another reassuring. client that that's right i've got another client that has a that operates a paper mill um and if you've ever driven by a paper mill, not so much nowadays, but in the old days, you knew you were near a paper mill. <laughs> yeah. You could be five miles away. You knew there was a paper mill nearby. They really stink. And, and you know, so, so I, I don't know if you consider that green. It's, pro it's probably not toxic. It just smells. And, uh, you know, so, so reining that in is, is a societal contribution, you know, and, and that, because it does impact society, you know, it impacts their local community. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things like that. So many different things I've seen in in the, in doing these assessments. Uh, but um, but but that's what leadership is all about. So so what I'd like you to do on uh, on this screen here is kind of just freehand. If you if you go to the top of your screen where it says annotate, um, if you click on that annotate button, you'll see a lot of different selections. You can click on text, the T for text, and and you can, uh, it'll open, if you click on the screen, it'll open up a box and you can just put, you know, anything in there. Oops, how come? You can put anything in there, I said. Huh, there it goes, okay. So you can put anything in there and it'll, it'll show up. Um, what I'd like you to do, let me just go ahead and, and just, and just kind of just brainstorm what areas of leadership do you think would have an impact on the technology, you know, implementation on technology 
adoption um, for a company? What kinds of things would be important in the leadership category that impact you know, the way and the, and the effectiveness and success of, of implementing technologies? Go ahead and start to put some things in there. Oh, go ahead, Karen. Yeah, okay, voice of the customer. Or that, is that uh, Bob? Yeah, okay. Engagement, yeah. Especially, particularly with them, not, not just employees, but particularly with employees. How about communication, right? The communication, being able to communicate, uh, you know, understanding the, uh, you know, establishing the mission, vision, and values, as I said, and, and being able to communicate those so that employees understand how they fit in, you know, where they, where they fit into, uh, to the company and, and, and they, you know, are they committed to the, to the, uh, um, you know, to the mission and vision, eliminating fear of failure. Yeah. That's part of leadership. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, when we talk about leadership, we're talking about, you know, again, how they communicate, how does the leader really communicate? How do they really set performance expectations for the company and, and engage the customers, engage the suppliers, and engage the, the workforce, particularly, uh, helping them to, to uh, you know, understand their part in what's happening with the organization. Um, creating value, I see there, you know, developing skills and growth, uh, aligning the team goals with the community. Yeah, so all those things are really, really impact, uh, you know, they impact the organization and, and as a byproduct. So almost, you know, the, the technology that uh, that an organization you know needs or or is, is uh, interested in implementing you know really is affected by by the leadership systems in the company right communication you know how how you know when you look at the approach is there an approach to communication is there a system for communication is it deployed is it being deployed beyond just manager I, I see many companies where they got great communication, everybody understands mission, vision, and value, but it doesn't go, it doesn't go below the first, you know, two or three layers of management. It might not get down to the employees. The employees are still out there in the, you know, sort of out in the cold, in my, my uh, the way I say it. Next is the strategy category. And you notice we're, we're, we're looking at this, uh, the left-hand uh, grouping, leadership strategy and customers. This is, in fact, that's called a leadership triad. And it, you know, uh, at the high level, it's really looking at, you know, how leaders lead, how they understand customer needs and requirements. And then strategy really is about how are you going to satisfy those customer needs at a high level? And so this question, this category asks questions about, you know, how you develop and implement strategies. Easy as that. Not only, you know, what are the, what are the steps of, uh, of your strategic planning? You know, are you, can, is it thorough? Are you considering uh, you know, your challenges, your strategic challenges, considering your strategic advantages. Are you, um, uh, are you considering what your, your core competencies are? And, and uh, you know, what are, the, what are the impacts of, of your environment? In, whether it's environment, you know, literally green environment, uh, the market, the, the regulatory environment, you know, what are those impacts on uh, on your uh, on your company, how do you think that strategy, you know, the criteria for strategy would impact the technological, you know, technology implementations? What what aspects of strategy would you consider, or or, or, are, or should be considered when you're considering company strategy? Good, understandable strategy to be able to add value at every level. Absolutely, understanding that. Um, you know, you're you're also looking at understanding how. Oops. 360 feedback. Um, you're also looking in strategy is, you know, uh, how do you consider, how do you consider innovation in, in your organization? You know, innovation, we heard from, from Rick Fern, uh, Fernandez last month at the last month's meeting, he talked about innovation and, you know, innovation is a process, it's a system. It's not just a one-off, hey, here's a great idea, let's do it. Um, there's, a, there's an approach to how you innovate. Um, there's an approach to, you know, looking at, um, uh, you know, what, are, what is it that we need to, to maybe our, some of our challenges are, uh, are uh, uh, profitability, you know, or, or margins or competition, you know, the cost competition. Um, maybe those are some of the challenges we have. Well, you know, how do we look at, 
uh, technology? Where can technology help us in our in our systems, in our processes, uh, in in uh, you know minimizing maybe minimizing some costs so that we can we can be better more more uh, able to compete on price with uh, with some of our competitors. Uh, you know, understanding the future market. I see there. Um, looking at overall objectives, you know, looking at, at workforce needs, the critical thinking skills, the team building, the accountability. Yeah, that's part of that's all part of strategy, understanding capability and capacity needs for the company, looking over, looking in the long term, planning ahead of time, uh, looking not only in, in the long term, but also in the short term. You've got to have both. Take a look at, at what's planned. So you've got to have that roadmap. You've got to have that, that plan for the company overall. So now as you start to bring technology in, it starts to fill in those little spots in your plan, fill in the spots where, you, where the technology should be. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm bringing in a, a new piece of equipment and you know, if based on my plan, you know, I'm gonna have that in 12 months. Well, what does that mean for, for my workforce? You know, how many more people am I gonna have, need if I need them? Or if not, what kind of new skills am I gonna have in the, in uh, you know, or do I need in order to be able to, to operate and to maintain that new piece of equipment in 12 months? Open mindedness, review of surveys issued to employees. Yeah, finding out what not only employees, but also in the customer. Because in the end, remember looking up at the at the, uh, the the framework at the top, we're talking about customers meeting customer needs. We really have to provide value to customers. So how is that technology gonna help us do that? So customers. In this category, it, you know, we're, how do we listen to customers? That's what we're wondering. How do we listen to them? And not only listen, but how do we learn from them? Are we looking at segmentation of our customers? You know, are there, how do we segment our customers? Are there, are there differences in our customers? Whether differences in the, in the groups of customers, uh, differences within the groups of customers, you know, maybe we've got some, some really high volume customers we might treat them, you know, uh, and focus on them differently than we do on on some of our low volume customers. But we should know that. We should know that. We should know how we build a relationship. So the relationships again with that with the A customer might be different from that C customer. Um, and then, you know, how do we know whether the customers are satisfied and engaged with uh, with our organization? So how do you think in customer, you know, when you when you considering you're assessing this this aspect of a company how would you consider the uh, uh, you know what the, what to or what would you consider I should say you know when you talk thinking about customers don't forget we're we're really we're focused on customer value that's what an organization should be focused on is our customer value we want to be able to provide um, provide exactly what the customer needs you know specific segments Communication with the customers, that's, that's a very important part of, of the relationship building with the customers. How do you do, how do you build that relationship? How do you make sure that your customers are going to come back? Um, customer strategic plans integrated into the firm's vision. Yes, you know, you've, you, you've, you've got to integrate the workforce. You've got to integrate the customers. You've got to integrate your suppliers. Uh, it's a, it really is, you know, an all around look. And Technology can help with that, right? It can help with trans uh, transparency, customer transparency into the organization. As a, a client, I I, uh, I recently assessed that uh, um, they their product, the customer goes online, the customer designs it, basically uh, colors, uh, um, you know, the basic design is there, and they they they, they look at if they uh, design the cosmetics, the colors, the shapes, and all that. And, uh, and they can see exactly what they designed. The company can take that, build off of that. Uh, the com customer can look and, and see through the technology that's being used, you know, where, what's the status of that, of that product, you know, coming. It's, it's a kind of a retail sort of a product. And, you know, what's the status? Is it ready? Is it, you know, when's it going to be ready? Where is it right now? Is it in test? You know, whatever, whatever that is, there's a lot of that, that, uh, that uh, transparency that the technology can Right, invisibility status. Yeah, that's what we were just talking about. That's right. Uh, understand customer needs. Two stops away. What does that mean? That's an allusion to Amazon giving you status on oh. your order. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's right. So there's there's you know there, Amazon's using that technology very well, right? It is bringing value. I think all of us who use Adam, Amazon would say, yeah, that's valuable to me. I can find out really really quickly what you know where my order is. I can get a copy of my invoice. I can do anything I want, basically. Full visibility into what's going on. 
workforce. So in this category, you know, it's asking about how you how you build an effective and supportive workforce environment, how you engage your employees, uh, you know, to to retain them and and to to get them to be high performers. One of the points that you can see at the bottom there is just from Sherm. Um, that they found that 20, fewer than 20% of employees, I'm sorry, employers, fewer than 20% of employers in seven high skilled economies are prepared to adopt digital workplace technologies. And that's the, that's the reference if you wanna see it. Um, so, so when we look at workforce, again, go to annotate, what are some of the, the considerations? And you notice, well, go ahead. Let me see what, what kinds of things you come up with. What's important? <laughs> that's right, customer, Customer focus is important, not only at the management levels, but it's important for employees. It's different. Customer focus and focus on the job, focus on quality, are both very important aspects of the workforce, you know, of the workforce um, uh, responsibilities, but, but they're different. You know, if you focus on the product, that's great. You'll, get a, you'll, you'll hit, the, hit the specs, you'll get the product out the way, the way it's intended to go out. But you lose, if you don't have that customer focus, you lose the perspective of the customer so that when you've got to make decisions as an employee you know, on the line, putting together a product, you, may, you might make the wrong decision if you're not aware of the customer perceptions. And, and so that's, that's really important. So yeah, you're gonna get some rude feedback perhaps, uh, but, uh, but you really need to understand what that means. Uh, improving skill sets, definitely, especially when you're talking about technology, new skills, you know, are a must. And, you know, that's, that's what happens with employees. If, if, uh, if a company just throws together the, te the technology, you know, and just puts it out on the floor, you know, the cobot in the corner under the tarp, uh, they didn't have the skills for people to maintain it or to operate it. That's really important. What in it for me, from the employee's perspective, is very important. It's important for everybody. But, but yeah, you know, so career development, um, the training and development of, uh, of individuals, you know, getting them ready, not just, not just skill ready for technology, but, but also getting them ready from a, um, you know, from a kind of a, a commitment standpoint. You know, if they're involved in part of the decision-making or at least in providing input to the technology that, that, that you're planning to put out on the floor or put out into the, into the organization, then, um, you know, then the more buy-in there is, the more success there'll be in, in uh, coming up with, uh, with the new technologies. Um, balanced scorecard, I think that what that means is, is uh, you know, you've got to understand the metrics for your workforce too. You know, are you looking at those key, key metrics, whatever they are, and it's important to you, you know, to, to know whether or not your workforce is operating at, at, the, at its potential, whether it is being developed over time. Sizing up talent, predicting staffing needs. Pipeline, yep, definitely need pipeline. So you've got to have the, your recruitment, policy, uh, uh, recruitment processes out there and, and the hiring process to be sure that you can get the, um, uh, you know, get the adequate talent that you need as you go forward. Operations, all right? Here we're looking at how you design, manage, and improve key products and, and, uh, and, uh, and the work processes and how you manage the operation, um, you know, and, and all of the daily work. So we're looking at, at the operations end. And it doesn't say it in the words here, but we're also considering the supplier, you know, supply chain activities um, in that. So, so what do you think, you know, here you would think that technology has the biggest impact, right? Because this is where in, in a manufacturing company, much of the technology will impact the operations floor, the production floor, you know, whether it's a conveyor belt or, you know, a visual, uh, you know, quality inspections, uh, you know, video quality inspections, or, or, you know, there's a million things I'm not saying that, that you all can probably come up with. But uh, so what are some of the considerations in operations, um, you know, relative to technologies? So, you know, when you talk about designing a process, you know, you've got a, if you're designing a product, um, you know, that's where technology really can have a big impact. One of the things that, this is kind of interesting, one of the things I found in, in working with uh, a lot of manufacturers, uh, they are pretty good, at least some of the ones that I've seen, have been pretty good at implementing new technologies into the product that 
they produce for customers because the customers usually ask, you know, they say, hey, can you do this? How about if you upgrade it to do that or do this? And, and they're really, they're, they're much better at putting technology, new technologies into their product than into their own processes in the, in the factory. Uh, they, just, they just, you know, haven't made that leap, that connection. You know, the customers want new technology, want advanced technology in the product and they'll design it in. They've got the engineering expertise to be able to do that. And they, they forget or they just overlook the fact that their own processes could use some technologies to help improve productivity, you know, reduce waste in their processes. As I see here, removing waste, applying lean operational principles, obviously technology can do that in a lot of places. You know, st standard work, you know, a, a, a machine is going to do probably, you know, you program it, it's going to do the same thing every time. So it's definitely standard, you know, having those controls on the process. Um, the, yeah, the, the virtual reality. I, I uh, had a customer, well, I can tell you who it was. It's Lockheed Martin. They make they make uh, the Lockheed Martin facility up in, in uh, Palm Beach. They make submarines, not the big ones, but they make small submarines. And uh, they, uh, when I visited them, it's been a while now, it's been about two years, but uh, when I visited them last, they had just designed a new submarine um, in a virtual world, uh, they, uh, they could actually, you know, the engineers could actually in the virtual world, get inside, they could see how this fits here and this fits there. And, you know, what they need to change on the inside to make, make this, this, uh, submarine. And they were able to design this, this new submarine in record time. Um, you know, so, so it really, it, you know, the, the technologies are, are out there to really improve operations, to make things much more, uh, efficient and, uh, and uh, you know, much less wasteful in terms of lean waste. Process improvements, uh, you know, again, operations, when we, when we look at operations, we look at how they improve. One of the things that we look for is the involvement and the engagement of employees. You know, are they, are they being engaged? Most companies encourage participation, or I should say that they encourage ideas from employees. Many of the companies I've seen they, they, you know, they, oh yeah, you know, we have an open door. They can come to us anytime with ideas. They can go to their supervisor. And, and in reality, that doesn't happen. Um, you know, what we're looking for is more structured way of getting input and getting involved, but like a Kaizen, you know, like a process improvement team, bringing employees in and putting them on the team as well, not just the management and the quality, you know, the quality people. We want to have the, the floor, the operators, the technicians involved in those, in those, um, in those kinds of, of activities, because that's where you really get involvement, you really get in, in engagement, you really get uh, uh, buy-in. All right, so measurement analysis and knowledge management. If you, if you look at the chart, I mean, the diagram, you see that's the that's uh, across the bottom. It was measurement analysis and knowledge management. So it's kind of two pieces to this category where it's, you're looking at you know, how they select, how they collect, how they use and analyze, and how they create information and action out of out of metrics out of, out of the metrics the, the hierarchical measures measurement system um, you know are the measures at the floor level tied to the measures at the operation at the uh, I'm sorry at the company level you know are those strategic objectives and the KPIs at that level have they been translated at every step of the way all the way down so that an employee can understand how what they're doing, you know, that, 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 that thing that they're building, how what they're doing actually ties all the way back to, to company success. Um, that's part of that integration. But, but if we're looking at the data side of that, the, end, the analysis. And then there's the knowledge management. You know, you've got knowledge uh, in an organization in people, right? Um, but you want to keep it with the company. So as people come and go, the knowledge doesn't come and go with them. Yeah, so with knowledge, knowledge management, you know, when people come and go, we want the, the knowledge to stay behind. Sure, you're not going to, you know, you get a 30-year experienced person leave. You're not going to get everything, uh, but there's a lot of stuff that they've done over the years that they've learned over the years that can be left behind. And I look at it the way, you know, if you can, if they can leave that behind by helping improve a process, if they can be part of that improvement team that, that worked on that process, that knowledge is getting embedded into the process. So the process becomes smarter. That's the, yeah, you know, I see institutional memory there. The process is becoming smarter so that a newer person can come in and benefit from the knowledge of the more senior person because it's built into the process. It's not the ground zero process anymore that it was. It's now kind of a step above. 
Uh, so measures, yeah, the, the measures, and of course they're they're going to tie directly to uh, you know you're gonna you should have measures at the strategic level and measures at every level, uh, you know, at all the key points going through, and not just not just lagging measures, right? Everybody, you know what lagging versus leading measures are. Lagging are kind of end of process measures, which are good and necessary. But a leading measure will give you an indication as to whether or not you're going to hit your targets for the ending, the, the, the lagging uh, measure as we go. So measurement, knowledge management, you know, again, knowledge management might mean, uh, you know, you might embed knowledge by uh, documenting every business process, every operational process and having it in a database somewhere. Uh, you know, that's that's part of, you know, that, that's where technology can fit in to help you with the, with the measurement with this category. Uh, it can help with with the accessibility of, of, um, of employees to the data so that they know in a timely way that, they're, that they are performing you know, up to snuff, so to speak, that they're hitting what they're supposed to be hitting. And, and uh, if they have leading measures to do that, um, that's great. And, and then results, this is category seven. This is you know, pretty self-explanatory here. Uh, you know, you're, you're measuring uh, and you're collecting that data that you planned for in that last category um, you've, you're, uh, you're looking at the, the effects, the effectiveness of all of your processes, you know, in customer processes, workforce, leadership, government, governance, finance, financial, the market, and strategy. Uh, you're looking at, uh, at all of that. And, uh, um, and, and it's, it's giving you, you know, kind of the answers. Yeah. You know, what are those processes? We, we, we scored those processes. Now, what do we see for results? Um, if the results are good, and then they're in the areas of importance, and you know maybe the process score could go up a little bit because because we, you know there's good integration that we didn't anticipate when we were looking just at the process. On the Baldridge side, if you look at the nist.gov/baldridge and you search for "Are we making progress?", you can find these two tools there, and there are a lot of other ones on the Baldridge site that you can look at. But the green one here is "Are we making progress as leaders?" And this is just are we making progress? This is for for the the, the workforce, for the, for the employees, other employees. And and but what these do, it's not it's not a true assessment, third party assessment like what I've been describing. Uh, this is more perception. So it's you know we're asking the leaders to to uh, to uh, you know evaluate how they think in each of those categories the co the company is doing. Same thing with the employees on the in the blue version over on this side. Uh, but it's the, only their perceptions. You know what? I don't know your experiences, but I've I've done these perception type of, of assessments with leaders, particularly, and um, and usually they're a little over over overly positive on uh, where they see the company as uh, you know on, on a high performance scale. Um, and so, but they're, but they're, they're useful, and like I say, there are other things you can find it. This if you if you if you can't find it there, if you want, I can. You can let me know. I can send you the. Uh, I can send you both of these documents. They're PDFs, uh, and they're they're on the website, as I said. Just kind of to summarize, you know how to how to be effective at implementing the technologies, the advanced technologies. You know, you've got to do the assessment. You've got to know where you stand. Uh, you got to know in, in leadership. You got to be able to communicate that vision that you know that has technology is incorporated into it. Uh, you've got to be able to to have the plan. You know, the strategy before you start, uh, you, you've got to be able to focus on the customer, you know, throughout. I mean, that, that, again, that's what we're all about. You got to make sure that the technology will actually add value for the customer. Uh, it may also add value for the owners of the, uh, you know, it may also add, add value for the, for the, the, the other stakeholders, the, the employees and the whole company. Uh, but customers certainly is, a, is, is, should be first in our minds. You got to be able to engage the workforce, get their buy-in. You know, you've got you got training, you got technology, new technologies that they've got to get used to and 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 use, um, and and then, you know engaging them is is really important. Get them involved. Uh, process before technology. You know, we've, I've said this a couple of times. You know, technology doesn't fix your process. Uh, your your uh, your technology is you know, if you if you got a bad process, the technology is just going to amplify the the problems. It's going to automate your problems. Uh, and then the metrics for reality, you know, you've got to be able to track the results. You've got to establish a hierarchical measurement system that, that will, will tell you how you're performing in all your, you know, all your important areas. 
And you've got to be able to track that and see, you know, see if you're making progress. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I know there was a whole lot of information there coming at you. <laughs> I didn't stop very, very often. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but if you've got any questions or, or comments right now, please uh, feel free to uh, to ask. Anything else I can amplify for you? Phil, this Go is ahead. Janelle. I, I wanted to Go ask, ahead, how long does it take you to complete an evaluation, an assessment well, for okay, good uh, question. The, the, one of the awards, for both of them, actually? Okay. Good question. So so for the, the, uh, the Sterling Award, you know, for the, the, the highest level award, the Sterling Award, takes a long time, you know, and an and examiner will begin training in August, you know, there's like a day of training in August, a day of training in September, and then three days of training in, um, at the end of October, early November. Um, so, you know, right there, you've got, you know, five days of training, plus some homework, it goes along with that. Um, and then, and then you're assigned to a team a uh, team of, you know, five or six or seven people, depending on the size of the organization, will, 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 will uh, you know, govern the size of the team. Uh, but then you'll spend probably another, uh, I would say, 80 hours, 80 to 100 hours between December and, and, um, and uh, early April. Um, so, and, and you, what you'll, you'll be working with your team on you know evaluating the the uh, the applicant for the award, um, and uh, and writing up you know comments and then doing a site visit. And there there are um, there are a number of phone calls uh, which kind of precede the site visit, but but save time you know for the, on the site visit. So you don't have you've got a lot of information up front. You can you can you you know start to analyze the data that you get and the, the observations that you make, so that uh, that you can do that. So so figure for you know, for a, a, a Sterling Award or the, or the Georgia Oglethorpe, either one, uh, you know, it's going to it's going to take you, you know, 120, maybe 140 hours of time between August and and April. Um, and, uh, you know, for for some of the others, it takes it's less for the for the you know other levels of uh, of assessment. They're not all award assessments. They're, they're, some of them are are really strictly for improvement opportunities. Uh, the, the, the manufacturing, the SMBE, the Sterling Manufacturing Business Excellence Award, uh, takes about uh, takes much less time. Uh, you know, we the way that that runs, uh, there's about a, well, there's some you know review of materials, so it's a couple of hours of of reviewing what the company submits. Uh, there's a, a, a you know, three-hour phone call, business overview call with the company, um, and uh, and then later there's a a five-hour phone call. Um, uh, well, they're all Zoom now, or well, they have been Zoom. On the site visits, they're, they're, we're moving into hybrid. So some will be on site, some will be off site, but you, we can have mixed teams that way. So, you know, for that, for a, uh, uh, you know, for an SMBE uh, assessment process, it, it takes uh, about 10, 10 hours or so. Uh, plus, if there's any travel, you know, to, to get to your, to the, you know, even if it's around town, you know how that could be. It might take you a couple of extra hours just driving to the site. If you're going to be on site, uh, if you're on Zoom, then you don't have to worry about the travel time. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. What is the okay. typical score of a Sterling winner? Sterling winners typically, you know, in the, I would say in the 600s, high 600s are the kind of the minimum, you know, the, 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 the minimum scores that would end up for a Sterling winner up to you know, in the, in the maybe 800, you know, high 700s in that range. And, and if they're higher than that, that's fine. But as like I mentioned before, it's, it's rare that we really see scores, you know, like in every category at 90%. That, that's very rare to see anything like that. And the way, the way that we judge, when we, when we do the, the judging of these, we, um, we have a team of about, right now we're six, and I think we're adding, we're looking to add another judge, uh, but, uh, Typically, we have teams of two. So when 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 the team of two judges gets the gets the the feed, final feedback report from the examiners, we get all the data too that they collected all along, all their all the results and, and everything else. And so one of those judges will be a primary, one of them will be a backup, essentially a secondary, and they'll go through the uh, you know the, the consensus report, reading all the comments of you know all the strengths, all the opportunities, putting all together, kind of summarizing 
in a, in a PowerPoint, we've got a template that we use for as a, a template for the, the, the judges use. And, uh, and then when we, when we will meet, uh, the judges will meet on one day in April, the end of April, uh, and we'll review all of the applicants at that point. And we'll usually start with what, what we consider what the judges who, who, who uh, evaluated might consider kind of the lowest scoring first, and we'll work our way up, you know, because um, typically you'll, you know, you'll hit the, there's a point where I say, okay, so is this company, when you get to, let's say the third, let's say it's five of them, you'll get to the third one maybe, and, and it'll, you'll say, uh, we'll say, uh, okay, so this one, you know, is, is might be considered a, a role model organization. Before this, no, the ones with those lower scores are not really role model. We'll take a look at this one. It may be considered a role model organization. It's right there, you know, maybe on the edge. Uh, we'll, we'll look into it a little bit more. We'll con actually, we'll call the team leader, the examiner team leader, and we'll talk with the team leader about asking, you know, we'll ask some clarifying questions. Not only on the meeting, we'll actually do that even before we get to the meeting, just to be sure we have the have answers. And then, uh, and then typically, you know, all the ones that were highest scoring, we'll look at them all. But if they were above kind of that threshold, then then they're going to be winners as well. Is there a cap on the number of um, recipients in a in a in a period review period? No, not for Sterling, not for Oglethorpe. For Baldridge, yes. In Baldridge, there is they they uh, they have, and I don't know uh, they Baldridge has certain categories, but they do have a limit on how many winners per group. Uh, with Sterling. They do group them, you know, they have uh, public organizations, small public large, they'll have healthcare large, healthcare small, uh, uh, you know, those kinds of, of groupings. Uh, there is no limit on how many winners there can be. Uh, the same thing with the, the manufacturing award, that Sterling Manufacturing Business Excellence Award, uh, there are no limits on how many uh, winners that there can be. Have you okay. seen a decline in the businesses that apply for participation to be assessed? In Sterling and Baldridge, a decline in the type of business in manufacturing. When 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 Baldridge was created and uh, and, and Sterling followed shortly after, uh, manufacturers were were there. It was basically only manufacturers, in fact, in the beginning. Um, and over time, the manufacturers had dropped out. Uh, the the Sterling Manufacturing Business Excellence Award was was an attempt by us to to reintroduce manufacturers to the concepts, but not the burden. It's not easy to, to apply for a Sterling Award or a Baldridge Award. It takes a lot of time up front, uh, a lot of time you know, to, to, uh, for the application, for all that stuff. And it costs some money, of course. Baldridge is more expensive than Sterling, as you might, might imagine. Uh, but um, um, but it takes, it takes a, it's a lot of burden on the organization to do that. Um, and I, my opinion is that the manufacturers are, um, have, have um, what's the, how do I put this? They've, they've minimized, they've leaned, <laughs> they were, that's the wrong way to explain it, but, but they've minimized the number of employees they have. They've really tried to in, in, increase the value per employee in their companies. So they don't have, uh, you know, not extra people that other organizations have, but but they have a little bit more flexibility in being able to apply time to this effort. And so the manufacturers have dropped out. And like I said, the SMBE was introduced to try to bring them back in to help them understand the concepts that I just went through with you, understand what high performance is and, and to be able to, to re-engage. Re and and it's, it's, it's been working. Um, you know, we get a lot, of, uh, a lot of manufacturers involved in our process uh, every year going, you know, uh, going through the, uh, the award process. It's not, it's not quite as rigorous as the, as you can imagine, just the number of hours is a lot different. It's not as, as rigorous as the, uh, the full Sterling award, but it's, it's a really good uh, approach for the manufacturers to understand and to make improvements. And we've seen over the years, I've, I've been back to some of the same companies, you know, that in multiple years, and, and I've seen the improvements that a lot of them have made taken from the feedback that they get from the assessments. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I got two questions to sort of off of what Janelle was saying. First of all, um, since there's no limit, is there like a, an absolute level, like a point level? If you reach this, you're gonna qualify for a sterling and if you're below it, you don't? Or is that up to the discretion of the judges or sounds kind of 
there's there's you know? no there's no number. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's a matter of uh, you know, every, every company that, that in, in Sterling, every company that applies will get a site visit if they want it. Um, in Baldridge, that's not true. In Baldridge, they, uh, the companies will be evaluated independently by individual examiners. And, and then at, at some point, uh, you know, two or three months into the process, they'll look at, at all the ind independent evaluations and determine which companies will be offered a site visit. So you might, you know, as a company, you might not get a site visit. You might just get a feedback report based on your written application. Um, in Sterling, every company that applies will get a site visit if they want it. So that, um, you know, there's there's no cutoff to get a site visit. Um, it's because you know because we have seen you know from the from the team consensus. Um, before site visit, there's some scoring. And then of course, when they do site visit, the scoring gets revised by them because they, now they see new things or they see different things that were not written in the application. Um, and so the scores could change. And, and typically they do go up on site because there's a lot more that the team can see versus what they can read. And, um, and so that's why we don't have a cutoff beforehand. We, we take them all in. Basically, you know, in the sense of what I'm saying, so that after every site visit, the judges will get to see all of them be able to look. We're not comparing one company to another, but we're looking at the relative that they, at their scores and and their their um, uh, you know whether or not the things that they're doing are are role models. Basically, I guess. Yeah, so it sounds, so you're, you're really concerned about consistency. It sounds like, which I think is really important because if you have a very mm -hmm. strong in one area and really weak in another that's a real yeah. that could be a real problem so you're worried about the mean but also the variance so it's just on it'd be interesting let's just say if you're able to put that into more objective and let's say an algorithm you could say no you know you have to meet a certain minimum average score but it's also your variance across that manner that must not exceed x to show that you're also consistent that just gets rid of some measurement error but my second question is um have you changed has not Strictly for Sterling, you can talk about Baldur if you want. Have the either points or the uh, categories changed over time? Yes, yes, they um, they have changed over time. They've they've evolved. Boy, when I first started in '94, it was quite a bit different. Sterling, the Sterling criteria obviously will follow what Baldridge does, and Baldridge does a lot of research. They change the criteria, not, not significantly, but whatever changes are going to be made are done every two years in Baldrige. Mm -hmm. And so we follow that you know, every two years. Every other, you, uh, we don't do it the same year they change. We, we're one year behind. But, um, but we're looking at you know, certain, certain activities. Like, for instance, in the early, early 2000s, you might remember the Enron scandal, right? Where, you know, with the auditing and, and all that, where, where the ethics uh, became paramount, you know, in all organizations. And that's where Sarbanes-Oxley and, you know, there were a lot of reactions to the Enron disaster, basically, the, the, uh, uh, that whole scandal with the auditing and the financial piece. And so at that point, you know, ethics was, is, is inherently or implicitly part of, of the structure, but it became explicit at that point. And, and you'll still see that today. It talks about ethical behavior and, and legal behavior. Uh, you know, in the criteria today, 20 years later. Um, and, and innovation, for instance, is, the, is probably the newest concept uh, that, uh, that's been explicitly, in, you know, introduced to the Baldrige criteria in the past two years, I think it is. So when you look at, you know, you look at the criteria and you look at the scoring guidelines, you'll see the word innovation in there, uh, thrown in at about the 50 to 65 level. And, and so, so that's where, you know, if, there's, if we don't see process, innovation type of processes, then that score is, is off limits. You know, you can't get to that point if there's no innovation. It's kind of like, like I was talking about with comparisons before. There's a cutoff there too. Go ahead. So I'm thinking that one of the last things I can remember is this whole change to risk managed stuff on ISO. Mm -hmm. Has that permeated Baldrige and or Sterling? Are you ex expecting you to overtly, overt risk management embedded or is it within operations? Or is, it, is it parametrically in each of your category? That's just curious. Yeah, it's not it's not explicitly with risk, um, although in the criteria, although I've seen it in practice in the manufacturers that they 
probably because of the influence of ISO, you know, for the, the ISO standards where, where it looks to risk, you know, they are looking at risk, uh, you know, more frequently uh, in strategy. You know, when you're looking at, when you're working right. on strategy, some of the companies, some of the real high performing ones are using risk as their strategy development, kind of our strategy development to a risk matrix. Uh, so, so yeah, it, it's in there again, it's, it's not quite as explicit as you'll find it in, in the ISO standards, but, but it's there. Bill, who audits you? Who audits you? Me as audits. me as in me personally, or you? Me as no, in no, company? no, not in you as your company. Who audits the the the? Who is the overarching uh, reviewers or assessors of what the Baldridge um, recipients? How that's assessed? Who audits what you do? What your your that team does? That's a Sterling. That, that's the the Sterling Council itself. Um, you know, the, there are about a uh, hundred in each year, about hundred and twenty examiners uh, in a in the Sterling pool of examiners. Roughly hundred and twenty. It depends on how many applicants there are. There may be more ap, uh, examiners, and typically about sixty percent are return examiners, um, and a smaller percentage, obviously, are examiners that have been around for, I would say, maybe maybe uh, maybe fifteen percent or fifteen to twenty percent are examiners who have been around, you know, more than five years. You know, we've got we've got examiners. Like I told you, I was a seventeen year examiner when I moved from examining to judging. Um, but but we have an examiner, you know, right now who's been an examiner for 25 years, I think it is, or maybe maybe even longer, because Sterling has been around for 30 years, and uh, and I think it might be even longer. You know, there's there's a uh, examiners who have been around, and those are the examiners, those very senior master examiners are the ones who who are who developed all the process. You know, they've been through the process, right? They're on a they're on a, 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 this committee we call it the examination team. Um, and and they're they're the ones who develop the training. They develop the whole all the processes, and you know it's an evolutionary process from year to year. So they build on what's what's passed, what's come before. Uh, but uh, but it's the it's the examiners themselves that are that you know assure they do they build the training, they do the training for all the new examiners and all the return examiners. Every examiner has to be has to be trained every year. Um, you know, so it's just because you've been trained once doesn't mean you, you get to, to slide, uh, you know, so you're involved. With it. So it's, so it, it, it sounds sort of like it's self-auditing, but it's, it's the growth, you know, it's the individual, um, it's the examiner teams and the examiner committee, examination committee that, uh, uh, that really sets standard for, you know, what's, what performance means as it is. And, and by through that, through that training, you know, one of the, the goals of the training is, is, you know, called calibration, so that uh, you pick any examiner and ask them to review a, a case, an application, they should come out pretty close in scoring in what they see based on the, the uh, protocols, of, you know, the, the scoring guidelines that I showed you earlier, based on the ADLI and, and the LE, LTCI, uh, based on all those things, you know, the, the scoring should come, come out very close. Okay, thank you. Other. Interesting. Very interesting. I want to thank everybody um, for, for attending here tonight.